And welcome to Advantage Radio Ministries, and welcome to Second Chances here at Lift FM. My name is Greg Hennis. Thank you for joining us. This is our weekly program each and every Tuesday where we are encouraged and blessed by so many different guests. Each of them may come from a different background or have a a specific thing that they are involved in, but they all have one common thread, and that thread is the Lord Jesus Christ because our guests have have chose to serve him, and we have a wonderful guest with us today. His name is Stephen. His wife's name is Sarah. Their last name is Williams, and they are the authors of Navigating Public Schools, charting a course to protect your child's Christian faith and worldview. Stephen, thank you for joining us. Yes, Greg. Thank you for having me on. It's a blessing to be here. It is a blessing to have you with us and, and a privilege. Um, Stephen, let's start off the program as I typically like to do and get a little bit of background on our guests. So give me a little bit about your upbringing and uh, also uh, tell me how you began your walk with Jesus. Uh, share a little bit of your testimony if you could too. Yes, you know, I love sharing my testimony and it's not your typical one. I I was really an atheist for the majority of my life. I waffled between atheism and agnosticism. My dad was a professor out of Cornell and uh, so I kind of grew up in that um, academic type of mindset that if you can't show it by reason and logic, then it's, you know, it's not true. And, um, and he kind of trained us or really raised us up that all uh, religious worldviews are based on myth and legend, not on actual reason, evidence, and logic. So I just discounted all uh, religious worldviews, went to high school, went up to UC Berkeley, and then um, uh, basically I was um, really seeking because I was confused. You know, I was kind of, I was into my 30s, and I was saying, wow, if this is all that life's about, life is, is pretty miserable. And um, uh, finally someone sat down with me, and they gave me a basic apologetic for the Christian faith. And, uh, and it really rocked my world. Uh, they ended up giving me Lee Strobel's The Case for Faith. I read that book, and, and I had never heard these, these apologetic arguments, these logical you know, reasons and evidence for the Christian faith, whether it's the reliability of the Bible or the you know, archaeological evidence that confirms you know, the Bible's basic biblical narrative, um, or all these amazing, really, mountain of evidence that there is for Christianity and uh, really rocked my worldview in, uh, in the winter of 2000. And then I joined a church and started to attend a Bible study and found that, hey, these people are, are not some cultish, you know, <laughs> strange group, but they're real people. And, and I committed my life to Jesus Christ uh, in the spring, the spring of 2001 and, and I've had a just radical conversion experience and been on fire for the Lord ever since. Wonderful testimony now. Obviously, you were an atheist. Uh, your wife, your wife was probably an atheist too. Um, so, tell me, uh, tell me how how you know that kind of worked with one of you surrendering your life and then another surrendering your life. Well, we both came to Christ before we were we got uh, we knew each other. Oh, okay. So, uh, yeah, but she was an atheist. She uh, got her PhD from Stanford in environmental microbiology. And, uh, and she gave her life to Christ through uh, InterVarsity Christian Fellowship and some other great campus ministries and campus discipleship groups like Crew and many others out there, Navigators and so on. Um, she gave her life to Jesus, and then um, uh, after we both came to Christ, we were doing ministry together, and that's when we met and then, uh, then got married uh, after that. So fast forward to this book that's entitled Navigating Public Schools, Charting a Course to Protect Your Child's Christian Faith and Worldview. Uh, first book, first uh, piece of work that you've done with your wife, or what's the story? Yeah, yeah, this is our first uh, book together. And uh, in fact, first book either separately as well. My wife is a writer. She has a writing background, has published some, some uh, fiction work. But um, uh, this was a blessing to work together. I was a public school teacher for 10 years down in California uh, before starting the, our ministry that we're in, Prepare the Way Ministries. Uh, but as a public school teacher, I just taught history using primary source documents. And one year, the school district kind of wrongly 
cited this separation of church and state, kind of this misleading metaphor that's so popular in our culture today. And they started to, to um, censor uh, primary source reference documents if they included Christian references. So, for example, William Penn, founder of Pennsylvania, wrote a document called The Frame of Government. He quotes Romans 13. And so they said, you can't hand that out because it quotes the Bible. Well, you and I know that's, that's crazy. And so we, uh, I called Alliance Defending Freedom, a Christian legal firm, and they represented me, and we uh, brought the lawsuit to the school. And um, that was kind of the genesis of uh, the ministry, started the ministry 11 years ago, and then finally got the book written um, this, this year. You also say that um, uh, there's a lot of a lot of difficulty um, when public schools, um, because they've become increasingly hostile toward the Christian faith. Uh, why would you say that there is so much hostility when you talk about public schools and you talk about Christian faith, and you put them in the same sentence? Well, I think in our culture today. Um, the evidences are a whole list of them, whether it's the 1947 Supreme Court decision, the Everson decision, where they took Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson's obscure letter that he wrote to the Baptists of Danbury, Connecticut, where they, they got this separation of church and state, whether it's this false, you know, misapplication of that phrase, or whether it's, you know, uh, people just thinking that, oh, well, you can't um, talk about Christianity, or you can't do this, that, or the other thing in public schools. But I think in a bigger sense, in a spiritual sense, it really goes back to what Jesus said, is that, you know, Jesus said, I haven't come to bring peace, but a sword. And so he's not talking about, you know, jihad or anything. He's not talking about military swords or weapons. He's talking about division. He's talking about Jesus. His teaching will divide. And I think that's the source of the hostility, really, is goes back to... Uh, it goes to people's hearts because if you um, if you believe in in Christianity and a Christian worldview and in Christ, it causes accountability and it causes you know uh, inner really uh, accountability to uh, the Word of God. And so I think that's a challenging thing, and that's probably the the greater reason why it's caused so much hostility. One of the things that uh, you point out is that you believe it's important for parents to establish a solid spiritual goal for their family. What do these goals look like uh, in the case of you and your family? Well, the goals need to be that we want to pass on our Christian faith as parents to our children. And so as families, the Word of God has to be central in our lives. So one of the things we do is we have a daily family devotional. Uh, Our kids are 12, 11, 7, and 3. And even our our seven-year-old, even our three-year-old is at times learning some great, you know, Bible stories from her older sisters, reading some good, you know, appropriate stories to her. So we we really want to center and ground ourselves on the Word of God daily and then encourage each other um, daily and throughout the week in that. So the Word of God needs to be foundational in families. Huge percentage of teens from Bible-believing homes leave their faith. Uh, tell me why that is. You know, I, I think a main reason is um, apologetics. They don't understand the reasons for their faith, and it tends to be more of a blind faith mentality that, well, I just have faith, and that's all that matters. And it's almost kind of a circular reasoning type of, of, of idea. Well, Thankfully, the Lord has not left us with just blind faith. We have uh, what's called reasonable faith. There's good evidence and reasons for the Christian faith. So I think apologetics can be a great tool both uh, to help young Christians as they mature into adulthood stand firm in their faith and maintain their faith, and it also helps believers be more uh, more effective uh, uh, evangelists and with um, just sharing the gospel and getting out there and uh, sharing, you know, the Word of God with others, it can help us to be uh, better evangelists with our, our friends and family. One of the things you, you talk about in the book, Navigating Public Schools, is the fact is that the Bible is the most reliable book, and obviously if, if you're new in the faith or don't know much about the faith, uh, how, how, how can the Bible be so reliable if, if you're in that position where you really don't uh, understand yet. 
Well, and that was one of the things that I believed the myth out there, that the Bible had been changed over time and it was unreliable, until, again, back in 2000, that person confronted my, my you know, false understanding of that, said, are you aware that the Bible is the most reliable document that we have in all of antiquity? And it's not just a faith statement, that's actually a statement you can prove academically. And so you can go in and look at the manuscript evidence for the Bible and find that the, the you know, 24,000 plus manuscripts, we can show an amazing you know, high level of confidence of what the Bible originally said. And so we can have an a- absolute, um, um, really miraculous confidence in the Bible, and that's what the Bible says, is that it's the inspired Word of God. And so the Lord has given us this mountain of evidence, and I think being able to communicate that effectively with non-believers can be a powerful, um, basically, partner with evangelism. We're visiting with Stephen, Sarah Williams. They are the authors of Navigating Public Schools, uh, charting a course to protect your child's Christian faith and worldview. Stephen, as uh, folks tune into the program and would like to learn more about you, about the uh, work that you're doing and this book, is, is there a website that uh, one could check out? Yeah, you bet. Our website is preparetheway.us, like United States. So it's www.preparetheway, all one word, dot U-S. And that uh, shows the ministry that we started 11 years ago. There's a link to our book, Navigating Public Schools, and they can find out about the work that we're doing that, that the Lord's called us to. You also talk about the so-called separation of church and state it is so misunderstood by many people and may create a double standard in the schools. Um, give us an overview what that is really about. Yeah, you bet. So, for example, during my court case, when um, you know they we were saying, hey, you can't censor primary source documents of our nation's history just because they have Christian references. Well, there was um, another teacher in our exact school district doing a uh, Muslim Living History Month during the month of Ramadan, and the kids were bringing prayer carpets to school. They had to memorize the five pillars of Islam. They were praying at school. So they were kind of living this life of a Muslim. And basically I make the case, and I said, look, are you okay with doing the equal, you know, scenario of uh, a Christian worldview? Are you okay memorizing the Ten Commandments and talking about uh, what it means to give your life to Jesus Christ or Holy Communion and, you know, living out the Christian faith? Uh, and so that's kind of really highlights this concept of a double standard. When you do other religious worldviews or even non-religious worldviews, you know, atheist worldviews, you're applauded for cultural diversity. But when you talk about the Christian, you know, activity in public schools, ooh, that's when the separation of church and state comes up. So that's just really a double standard, and it shouldn't be. You know, one of the things I know you were quick to point out is that the fact is your book is not just a gripe about public education, but it's, it's really put out to, to give practical ideas about what is permissible in schools and, and, and tying that with some of the misconceptions we have, Correct. Yes, and you know, I also want to go back right in the introduction of the book. We're not saying in the book that all Christians need to be in the public school system, but we're also not saying that all Christians have to get their kids out. What we're saying is families and parents in particular need to pray about where to educate their kids, and then if it's in the public school system, they really need to be proactive in finding out where this hostility to a Christian worldview can crop up. It doesn't always crop up. Uh, I've mentioned in the past, but I, there's, I know Christian teachers, I know whole school districts that do a curriculum that's very honoring of a Christian worldview. It is not hostile to a Christian worldview. So you really can't make the case that all public schools are hostile to Christians or a Christian worldview. They're not. I know schools that, that aren't at all. Uh, they're very friendly, actually, to Christians. And some, I know teachers that pray with their kids. So we're not saying, you know, you have to get your kids in or out. We're saying pray about it. But then if they're in the public schools, yeah, what we want to do is really help encourage Christians on how to live out their faith and be a light for Christ in schools. You also talk about the fact that many Christians have been politically asleep. Uh, explain to us what you mean by that. Well, just a simple thing in just voting. You look at the um, statistics on the evangelical body of Christ. There's about 60 million 
Bible-believing evangelical Christians in America. And each election cycle on the presidential years, about half, almost half of Christians sit out those elections and don't even vote. And then on non-presidential, you know, the off every other year, they're... Um, they about two thirds of the body of Christ don't vote at all. They just don't even vote. And so, as you probably know, there's great Christian voters guides that can help guide the body of Christ as to the candidates, the bills, or or different you know uh, legislation that's up for a vote. So we really should just be uh, at a minimum uh, doing good godly stewardship of this nation the Lord has given us in the United States, and and actually be involved. In, at, a, at a minimum with voting. Another thing you talk about is historical revisionism. Um, tell us what exactly that is. Yeah, it's when Christianity is portrayed in a biased way. It's either biased presentation, where they focus on the negative things done in the name of Jesus and downplay or neglect to share you know, the amazing positive things that, that Christians and, and Christianity has done throughout the ages. Uh, it's also omission, where they omit references to God out of primary source documents. And what that does is it can make Christians more ashamed of their faith, but it can also make non-believers more hostile towards Christianity. So it is a big deal, and we have a whole chapter on that in the book and, and how to deal with that. Our guest is Stephen Williams. The book is entitled Navigating Public Schools, Charting a Course to Protect Your Child's Christian Faith and Worldview. Uh, Stephen, if they're just joining us right now, the website, the uh, address that they could visit to learn more about this book and the ministry work that you're doing? You bet. Preparetheway.us, like United States. www.preparetheway.us. Uh, something else you mentioned, that there are a few issues that are more contentious than teaching of evolution. You also say in the book that science and Christianity are not at war. What else do you say? Well, yeah, you know, my wife is a Ph.D. from Stanford in environmental microbiology, so she's, <laughs> she's the brainiac of the family. And uh, so we, we wrote uh, this whole section together on science and Christianity. We really want to encourage believers to know the mountain of evidence scientifically for God and then also understand the, uh, the massive holes in naturalistic Darwinian evolution. So one thing we talk about is that. But also, like, how do you deal with it when a teacher basically calls kids stupid or ignorant? And literally this happens <laughs> every seminar we teach. We have kids coming up and said, yeah, I was told I was dumb because I believed in creation. And that's actually illegal to do. So it's called viewpoint discrimination. You can fully believe in creation, uh, you know, as origins. And so you can have that faith. You can, you can communicate that faith in science class. Uh, free from discrimination. And if you are discriminated against, we talk uh, people through how you deal with conflict well uh, in those, those situations. There are some other big issues that often affect uh, students and catch them off guard, such as abstinence, education, holiday celebrations, bullying. Uh, when those things come up, how do you handle them? Yeah, you need to know what your rights are. So, for example, there's many um, abstinence education programs that are excellent out there, but some, even with the term abstinence in there, are more kind of Planned Parenthood-endorsed comprehensive sex education programs. So you need to be able to spot these, and if they're more you know, anti-Christian worldview, you need to pull your kids out. So you need to know how to do that, how to do that well, how to find out what uh, the curriculum is, and, and parents have a right to do that in all curricular areas. They can find out what is being taught before it's being taught, and some of those are some of the hot-button issues to find out about. Our guest is Stephen Williams, the book Navigating Public Schools. Um, talk to us, uh, Stephen, about the idea of moral, um, moral revelation and how it plays out in, in public education. Talk to us about that. Wait, what was that? The, uh, what? Uh, moral issues and how it plays out in the public education. Yeah, moral relativism is a big issue. And so, for example, um, well, let me give you a, a scenario. When I was a teacher, I was in a teacher's meeting, and the other teachers were talking about morals. And they started to take this kind of, you know, uh, politically correct thing, but we can't teach morals as, 
as teachers. And everybody started to agree with this and, and say, well, yeah, we can't teach any morals because that's taking sides and we need to be neutral towards everything. And I finally, I, I said, well, hang on a second. So you're saying we shouldn't teach our kids like not to lie, that telling the truth is something good, or we, sh- we should teach them that treating others the way you want to be treated, we should not teach them that. And they all realized kind of the silliness of where they were going, that of course in, teach- in, you know, in schools you're going to teach you know, morality of, of some basic you know, baseline. So, so they got it, and they immediately said, well, of course we're going to teach that. And I said, good, because that's actually what we should be doing is teaching you healthy, godly, really godly morality is where treat others the way you want to be treated comes back to Christ, and even more so in the Old Testament. So uh, we talked about that, and, and just the silliness of, of this political correct attitude that you can't teach morals is very prevalent out there. You also give clear advice to parents and students about how to handle conflict. What is some of the advice that you pass out? Yeah, so uh, for example, we are Christ's ambassadors, and we need to speak the truth in love. And one of the things is, you know, if something comes up, say your child comes home, and the teacher said you can't read your Bible during free reading time, many parents kind of go, well, I'm going to get that teacher fired, and they 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 start to really get angry look we should not come at this from you know this well i'm going to get angry and go you know stick it to them basically what we need to do is really pray through how we can be christ's ambassadors in those scenarios so absolutely that's one of the reasons we wrote the book is to take action don't sit back don't remain silent get involved but really importantly we need to be speaking the truth in love and you know, handling everything in a winsome way because people are watching us. And what I found is a lot of these scenarios can open up doors to the gospel and to uh, Christianity and, and the gospel of Christ being shared to non-believers. Most Christian parents, if you talk to them, say, "Well, they want their kids to be a positive influence in their schools." Uh, how do we do this effectively, though, and encourage them? Yeah, I think, again, parents need to be proactive. They need to get resources on what they can do. And again, we didn't just write the book for parents and students. This book is for teachers, administrators, volunteers, you know, young life pastors. They can use the public school system as a platform for ministry. So that's another thing. We, we, we put a whole appendix section of knowing your rights, students' rights, parents, but also teachers' rights, religious clubs, their rights on public school campuses. So we talk about all of that to hopefully empower the body of Christ that they can be a light for Jesus on public school campuses. As a former public school teacher, um, Stephen, do you think it's time to remove our kids from an increasingly secular public school system? Yeah, yeah, like I mentioned, you know, we talk about that right in the beginning. Um, I don't think we're there yet. Now, there are a lot of schools, there's, there are particular schools that, yeah, I would say uh, are, are, some of them are so hostile to a Christian worldview that you probably shouldn't have your kids even in that entire school. But that's generally not the case. Where I live, where communities across this nation, as I've mentioned before, there are, are Christian teachers, you know, very friendly um, environments to a Christian worldview. So no, I don't think we're at the place where we need to just pull them out carte blanche. And so that's why we say in the introduction, you need to pray about where to educate your kids. If it's the public schools, get equipped on what your rights are. Stephen, of course, the, the number one reason this program is put on, obviously we like to educate, but the most important education we can do, to be very blunt, is to give any listener that is tuning into this program, this radio station, or perhaps listening to us on, on YouTube or whatever, the opportunity, if they are not saved, because time is short, to give them an opportunity to invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of their life, just like you made that decision many years ago, like everyone else that serves the Lord made that decision, and we want to give them an opportunity right now. So, Stephen, with that in mind, would you be willing to to say a prayer for those listeners that are ready to make that change? Absolutely, I'd love to. In fact, you know, when I was an atheist, I thought this myth, this I, this false, you know, teaching the uh, idea out there that 
that Jesus was a mythological figure, and he, and he wasn't based on evidence, and that's just not the case. So I want to encourage all the believers, or all the, not just believers, but all the, if they're a non-believer out there, that there is a mountain of evidence to believe that Jesus Christ not only was a real person, but that he truly lived, and the Bible te- you know, goes through what he taught, and it's accurate in all of its teaching. And, um, and, and appeared to over 500, and then the birth of the church. So I want to encourage anybody out there who maybe hasn't heard that before. There's a mountain of evidence to believe in Jesus Christ. And, and just maybe pray a prayer that I prayed, uh, which was basically um, giving my life to Christ. And that's one thing that I actually resisted doing for a long time. But uh, when I finally did, that's where, that's where I was set free. And I prayed something like this. I just said, Jesus, forgive me for my sins. Thank you for dying on the cross for your shed blood that covers my sins. I put my faith, hope, and trust in you alone, and I trust that you will fill me with your Holy Spirit, and you will guide me and direct me in an abundant life, in a life that that you've called me to. So I just pray that for anybody listening. If they've never done that before, they could do that in Jesus' name. Our guest on Second Chances has been Stephen Williams. Him and his wife, Sarah, are the authors of Navigating Public Schools, Charting a Course to Protect Your Child's Christian Faith and Worldview. Stephen, one more time, a website if they'd like to learn more about this book or other work that you've done. Yeah, Greg, it's preparetheway.us, and they can click on that link and um, a link to, to Navigating Public Schools, the book, and also just the uh, ministry, doing workshops and seminars around the nation. Amen. Well, our guest is Stephen Williams, the book, Navigating Public Schools, Charting a Course to Protect Your Child's Christian Faith and Worldview. Tune in next week for more Second Chances right here from Advantage Radio Ministries on Lift FM.